Hi, this is Lenny Cameron. I am here with my friend, Nancy Johnson. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Lenny. <laughs> and we are here to talk about her debut novel, which just came out, The Kindest Lie. Man, Nancy, this book is showing up everywhere. <laughs> I, I mean, know, I'm so excited. I've got a little yeah. list here just to give people a sense. It's in the greatly anticipated books list for Marie Claire, Good Housekeeping, Refinery 29, Woman's Day, Pop Sugar. It's got a blur, but by Jody Picot. Wow. I mean, how does it feel to, like your book is like already out there all over the place? It's such a wonderful feeling because it took me about six years to write the book. And when you spend all that time and the book is just in your head and in your imagination, you don't even imagine, you know, what it's like when it finally hits the world and it's on the stands and everybody's reading it. But it has just been um, overwhelming in the best possible way. I'm starting to hear from readers, you know, who are connecting with the characters and they're telling me that Ruth and Midnight, my main characters, feel like people they actually know. And I'm like, wow, you know, because it's like I was able to create characters that jump off the page and feel incredibly real to people. And that's just the the best part about all of it. And then this um, professional acclaim, critical acclaim is just the icing on the cake. So for those who've not yet heard about the book and the story, tell me a little bit more about Ruth and Midnight's story. And I'm also reading it. I'm about three quarters of the way through and it's an amazing, amazing book. But tell people who don't know this book a little bit more about it. Sure, sure. So The Kindest Lie is a story of family and love and sacrifice. Uh, all of it at the intersection of race and class at the dawn of the Obama era. And the story really centers on Ruth Tuttle, who is a Black woman engineer, Ivy League educated in Chicago, very successful, uh, but she's been harboring a big secret. She had a baby when she was just 17 years old, and she left her son behind in the dying Indiana factory town of her youth. So she decides to go back to search for her son, and when she gets there, everything has changed. Uh, the factory town that was the beating heart of Ganton, Indiana, is now shuttered. It's closed. So a lot of her family members, people she knows, are out of work. And also her family has been keeping a lot of really big secrets from her. And then when she gets back to her town, she meets and forms an unlikely friendship with a young white boy named Midnight. And he is mired in the very poverty that Ruth managed to escape. And so when the two of them come together, the forces of race and class uh, really conspired against them. And they're set on this um, collision course that upends both of their lives. So that's the story. And I love some of the words that are coming up in the reviews. I'll give you a sense. Um, here's just a few words that I saw when I looked at your reviews. Mm -hmm. Vivid, soul stirring, vividly told, powerful, emotional journey, unforgettable characters. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing to hear that. You know, I mean, it, just the fact that it's resonating with people and that they're feeling all the things that I wanted them to feel when I was sitting in Starbucks, you know, <laughs> typing away, uh, telling this story. That is the best possible uh, outcome of all of this. So, so let's take a quick peek at that Jody Picot review, which is just fabulous. And I, I don't know if folks realize that this is unusual, right? Getting a review from Jody Picot is not something that happens for the average debut author. I and know, so I was I love I'll tell you how it came about if you want to hear this. Yeah, story. go for it. The backstory, you know. So uh, Caroline Levitt uh, is a New York Times bestselling author. And she actually critiqued um, an excerpt or actually the entire book uh, early on. Uh, you know, in the process before I had a literary agent and she fell in love with the book. And so then fast forward to once I got the book deal, she tweeted uh, at Jody Picoult and told her that, you know, I think you'll love this uh, book. And Jody said right away, OK, I just pre-ordered it. Wow. And, you know, um, you know, she said she'd be willing to read an advanced copy of it. And then she blurbed it. So it's just the writing community has been incredibly generous. And that's just an example of it. And Jody and I are also going to be doing an event together uh, in March, late March, um, about fiction and race in America, because, you know, her book, her earlier book, Small Great Things, dealt with race and racism. And so we're going to talk about both of our books and uh, some of those topics and ideas oh. that 
that I'm you know coming. we're oh, glory. Come to that sounds amazing. I know, I know. I'll be putting out uh, details on that. So let's take a quick peek at that review from Jody. I loved how she captured this idea that it's a deep dive into how we define family and does our past become the skeleton on which our future fleshes out. And those thoughts for me came across, and as I was reading this book, it was evoking a lot of questions for me about like, you know, we're born into a certain moment and a certain place and a certain time and a certain skin color, and that affects the trajectory of our whole lives. And I'm just interested in like, how did you have the inspiration for a book like this? Where did it come from? Yeah, definitely. I definitely think we're so defined, you know, by what we've experienced in our past and who our families are. Um, you know, we don't come into the world fully formed with these beliefs that we have right now as adults, you know, so all that shaped uh, early on. Um, I was inspired by the events of November of 2008 when Barack Obama was elected president. Uh, it was a bittersweet time for me. Uh, my father uh, had been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And um, so it was terminal. And I knew that he probably wouldn't survive it. And so in October, uh, I convinced him to vote early. And he did. Uh, and he was actually bedridden by election day. And so here was a man who survived World War II and the Great Depression and Jim Crow, and he cast the last vote of his life for America's first black president. And so that is just um, an amazing thing. And so it was a time of hope um, for my father, for my family, for so many in the black community. But I think across the board, I mean, you look at people across the political spectrum, you know, Republicans, independents, and Democrats felt like this was a moment of progress, that we had achieved something monumental by electing a black president. However, just because we elected a black president does not mean that we are now in a post-racial era. And that's what so many people were saying. You know, oh, racism is over. We've, you know, got a black president. But I knew that wasn't the case. And so that's what I wanted to explore was this divide between black and white America that I saw playing out on my social media feed throughout the Obama campaign in 2008, and then subsequently uh, during his presidency. And if you look at where we are today uh, in America, you know, just look at the insurrection at the Capitol earlier this year, you know, and it shows you that we have so far to go in ridding ourselves of white supremacy and really being anti-racist. But I thought of these characters, Ruth and Midnight and their families, you know, a black woman, you know, successful, but comes from poverty, a white boy coming from an impoverished uh, background putting them together at a time of economic despair during that uh, great recession. And just like what we're going through right now, you know, and seeing what makes them tick, what motivates them and how they've been shaped by those experiences. We've written an amazing book. I'm so appreciating it. It's one of those books where I'm like, oh, she did this so well. I have so many moments in the book that I'm like, oh, I see what she did there. And she did it so well. That means a um, lot coming from you, Lainey. Thank you. Did it, did it change a lot, the book, from like your first versions and your first drafts to the version that readers are, are seeing now? Has it changed a lot? There have been some changes with it. Um, in my early iteration of the novel, um, I'll let you in a little secret, Midnight was actually a black boy <laughs> when yeah. I first started writing, you know, kind of the first yeah, 25, 50 pages of it. But then once I thought I really want to get inside the head of the, the white community, you know, and see where they are, because we all stay in our entrenched corners and we don't really, um, you know, transcend some of these barriers. Then I thought, yeah, I'm going to kind of transcend my own barrier and get in the head of a white boy and figure out what's going on with him and his family. So that's different. Also, in an earlier version, I was telling it from four points of view. So right oh, now, wow. you know, the final book is two points of view, Ruth and Midnight's. I also had the point of view of Eli, whom I love. He's my favorite character. That's Ruth's brother. And uh, also telling it through the perspective of Mama, another character mm. I'm crazy about. That's uh, Ruth's grandmother. And so I had all four perspectives because I thought, oh, my God, they all have something important to say sent it out to literary agents. And they're like, oh, that's too many people. The story is getting too, you know, uh, spread out and you need to focus it more. And I think they may be right because now through Ruth, you get to know Eli and you get to know Mama. So we still have their perspectives there, but just through uh, my main point of view characters. 
I think it works. It focuses, like you say, the story in on the two most important characters and what gives you space for what they're thinking, right? Yeah, and that's what the whole revision process is about and getting other eyeballs on it, you know, because a lot of times you don't know, you know, it's my first book. <laughs> so it's been great to have those other eyes on it. And actually, that's my next question for you is any advice for people behind you on the journey, perhaps? What, what have you learned that you could share? Yeah, I talk to a lot of people who are just starting out, you know, writers who are beginning this and so many of them. And I think I'm sure you get the same questions, you know, how do I get a literary agent? How do I get published? You know, and really the question needs to be, how do I make this book the very best book it can be? Because that's what it is. It's not about, you know, the, the end game of getting published. It's about working on your craft. So that would be my advice. You know, you've got to write, you've got to revise, you know, and do it over and over again until you get that book to where you want it to be. Whether you're doing traditional publishing or independent publishing or a hybrid, it doesn't matter. You still want the very best book that you can write. That would be my, my best advice to people. And also, don't chase the trends. You know, you've got a lot of folks out there who are like, oh, I see girl in the title of all these hot books that are out there. Do I need to put that in there? Or, oh, maybe vampires are hot again. You know, don't do that because it's such a long process, as you know, Lainey. And, you know, it took me six years to write this. But then, you know, it was more than a year that I was out there searching for an agent. Then once I got a book deal, you know, it's like 18 months, you know, year and a half process before the book actually hits shelves. So if you are chasing a trend by that time, the trend has passed you, you know, so don't and chase the trends. Yeah. And also you need to want to love the story enough to stick with it for six, eight years before it sees the world. And if you don't love this thing to death, you'll be sick of it before you get that far. That is so true, Lainey. I mean, it's like you have to love it. You have to tell the story of your heart, the story that only you can tell. And that would be my advice. That is fabulous advice. Well, before we wrap up, I know you're a huge reader and a huge supporter of other writers. Are there any books you'd like to highlight that you've read that you would love to show us? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, a few that I've been reading, uh, several of them are debuts. This one, Wild Women in the Blues, hopefully you can see that, by Denny S. Bryce. So it's got Jazz Age Chicago and racketeering and all that. Great book. It's coming out in March. Then Waiting for the Night Song as well by Julie Carrick Dalton. This one is a must read. You know, it's dealing with climate change and childhood secrets and immigration, a lot of big issues. That one has already debuted, so it's on shelves. You can get it now. Julie has been my literary soulmate on this journey, so for sure. And then another one, The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. And this one is historical fiction, 18th century London, and it's dealing with apothecaries and poisons and getting back at the men who have wronged the women in this story. So this is definitely another one that you definitely want to read. It's a hot debut coming out uh, in March. Another one is Little Pieces of Me, if you can see that one. I'm trying to make sure you can see it, not too much of a glare. Little Pieces of Me by Allison Hammer. I was lucky enough to read an early uh, advanced copy of this particular book. It's got DNA and identity, mother-daughter relationship. Um, definitely, this is the sophomore novel for Allison Hammer. You definitely want to check this one out. And then finally, my last one is The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delilah, Delilah Harris. And this one is coming out in the summer. Everybody's talking about it. It's a thriller that also deals with racism in the workplace. So very timely issues. And I just love the cover, you know, with the hair and the Afro pic and there's just so much to love about this one. So that's the most recent one I've read. I'm going to have to get that one. I'm off to NetGalley to see if I can get it. That's the only yeah. one I have read of the ones you recommended and fabulous, fabulous picks. Definitely. Well, before we let you go, let's look at how people can connect with you if they want to follow you um, on social media. So you're yeah. at Nancy J Author on Instagram. Yeah, and, and on Twitter. This is also my Twitter handle, at Nancy J Author. And nancyjohnson.net. And they can find all your social other social medias if they prefer Facebook or anything else there. And I'm also excited to talk to readers so and to join book clubs, to have discussions. So feel free to reach out to me. And when people message me or, you know, talk to me on social, I, you know, usually respond if I see the message, as long as it doesn't get buried in my feed. <laughs> right, right. 
Awesome. Well, yes, I'd encourage folks, if you've loved the book, if you want to give Nancy any feedback, I know she'd love to hear. Um, yeah. It actually makes a big difference to us as authors when people actually tell us they love the book. So I know it's that whole thing of living with it for, you know, six years in your head. And now I'm like, wow, people want to talk about it. I'm so excited to do so. Awesome. Well, it was so lovely of you to join me today, Nancy, and I'm so excited for you. And I know this book's going to do phenomenally. I'm waiting to see the best seller tags just rack up here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lainey, for having me.